while we're on the subject, myself and Mary would love to thank you for your donations that you've given today and yesterday as well. Um, we actually live off those donations, so that's the only way in which we live. That's our only source of income. Okay, um, I was going to hand across to Peter, I think, because he was uh, patiently holding his hand up uh, just before the group, before we broke. So let's do that. Thanks, AJ. AJ, this is regarding abortion. There's, it's a threefold question. Yep. Um, one of them is the... Um, I've seen uh, videos of abortions where the uh, fetus has been torn to shreds by a suction device. The physical effect on that on that form on the spirit. What is there any residual when that spirit actually uh, transcends uh, the physical form? Um, the fetus feels pain, and um, so the intensity of the pain will depend upon the uh, generally and there, there's a difference between intensity of pain and the duration of pain so so the problem with uh, any abortion of course is that the fetus is going to feel pain associated with the abortion now the pain is twofold the pain is firstly the physical pain which will be either short and intense or quite a bit longer and drawn out depending on whether abortion has occurred through chemical means or through physical means. When the, the, and when the pain, the, there is um, spirits who actually help the fetus, so, the soul and the spirit body of the fetus go out of body. So what they do, and this is no justification by the way for abortion, but what they do is they nurse the child through the painful experience by helping the child be out of body and not feel all of the feelings associated with the physical pain itself. Because the spirits who do that um, know the intention of the parent, so therefore they surround. So abortion clinics are actually surrounded by spirits who are trying to nurse children through this process of transition, which is quite painful. The second question, and, and by the way, these questions, a lot of these questions that you've been asking me about abortions, and there's been quite a few of them even privately, uh, are prompted by also some spirits who want to know about these answers, so I want to give fairly concise answers. Um, the second part of the pain that they feel is the emotional pain. Now, the emotional pain begins that the, the moment that the parents feel an emotion that they're going to go ahead with this. Up until that time, what happens is that there is usually an oscillation of emotion in the, in the mother particularly, but also in both parents. So you'll get an oscillation of emotion of, oh, yes, I think I should do it. No, I, I don't think I should because I feel guilt. And yes, I think I should. And no, I don't. And eventually, as with any doubt emotion, which is a painful experience for any person to go through, you eventually settle on one side or the other. So one side is keep the child, the other side is abort the child. When you settle on abort the child, the child instantly from that moment on is starting to feel emotions of rejection. And uh, in fact, uh, many people have the effect of having a miscarriage at that point because the child actually can feel the emotion of rejection. So, so some people actually have the physical feelings of not wanting the child and the child actually miscarriages because of that emotion. Now those emotions pass into the child. So you've got this instant in, intense or, or drawn out, depending on what kind of means were used to abort the child, uh, coming in as sensory input into the soul of the child. And then you've also got the emotional response of the child, uh, which is uh, actually more painful to the child and of longer duration generally. Now what happens is the, the, the a nursing spirit, if we can call them that, which is usually a celestial spirit who is assigned by God to nurse that particular child, will actually try to prevent the child from experiencing a lot of the physical pain associated with it, but the, the nursing spirit will allow the child to experience their emotional pain. So what happens is the child does a lot of crying initially in the spirit world after that first initial <coughs> process of abortion occurs. So the spirit, celestial spirits there nursing this child and through this process of emotional pain of rejection. Then the spirit gives all of the love that the spirit is able to give and that actually regenerates the child and allows the child to have an emotion inside of it of uh, self-awareness, 
regarding its own identity and also allows the child to experience a feeling of self-worth. So the child then gains a feeling of self-worth. But in order to actually allow that process to continue, which may take many months, the, the nursing spirit um, prevents the child from visiting the parent. And it actually prevents, I don't know if you're aware of it, whenever you have an emotion for somebody, for whatever reason, whether it's a, a, a love-based emotion or, or a, a, an unloving emotion, there is an emotional hook that goes out of you to, and, and it's like a stream of energy that goes out of you to the other person. And so if you're a mother who's aborted or your father or mother is aborted and you still have the emotions that I've done the right thing and so forth, there's this emotional energy going out towards the child. And what the caring spirit does is cut that energy off from ever receiving the child, being received by the child. So the child doesn't get those emotions. And that way the child is allowed to go through this process of actually having some self-worth and growing up with self-worth. Now what happens a lot of times is a mother, uh, a lot of times, or both the mother and father, at some point in the future recognise the, the choices that they've done and they go through these emotions of, wow, I realise now that I've done the wrong thing in this particular situation. The key is to look at, uh, I mentioned this earlier to somebody, but I think I'll write it on the board um, in terms of what kind of emotions uh, to go through. There's usually a whole group of two separate sets of emotions. There's the, there's the reasons, and I'll put the word reasons in quotations, because really they are the justifications of why the abortion took place. My suggestion is if you have had an abortion, write down all the reasons why at the time you felt you needed to do that. Does that make sense? All the reasons why. Both parents, not just the mother, because this is a, something that's attributable to both parents. All the reasons why. In the reasons why, if we refer to all those reasons, they are your fears. Does that make sense? The reasons that you're listing, so the reasons why you did the abortion, when you list them all, they are all your fears. And to be frank with you, those fears were great enough to create the destruction of life. Were great enough to cause you to destroy life. So they're pretty big fears. Does that make sense? Now, those fears are pretty big fears and they cover grief inside of you, some, some causal grief inside of you from your own childhood. Do you follow me? From your own life. And the key is to allow yourself to firstly identify the fears and then allow yourself to feel the grief of those causal emotional reasons why you justify the destroying of life. You only justify the destruction of something through a fear. Now that's one set of things to do. So that's one group of emotions. There's a whole other group of emotions you're also going to have to work through uh, with regard to abortion. And that is, a, you will have an emotion generally of guilt. G-U-I-L-T, guilt. guilt. Now, an emotion of guilt is a pointless emotion to experience. When I say pointless, it is your way of getting out of other deeper emotions. All right? Now, let's see what you're getting out of with this guilt. There is actually a process that goes on in your soul when you do something disharmonious with love. And this is anything disharmonious with love, by the way. This process happens, but it happens a lot when we do big things disharmonious with love more than when we do little things disharmonious with love. And that is, we have this law that comes into operation called the law of compensation. You probably have heard of it as the law of karma. Right? What you sow, you reap. It is actually a law that causes a consequence to be placed upon your soul for actions that you took that were disharmonious with love. Whether you are sensitive to them or not, sometime in the future you will feel them. Now for most people they don't feel them when they're on earth. 
So what they do is they, you know, go through life trying to ignore it. And you know how you have these little thoughts pop up. Oh, the abortion pops up in my mind. Oh, suppress that back again and we're off with life again, right? That's how most people react to these kind of events. Does that make sense? So another thought pop up. Oh, I treated that person badly. Oh, suppress that one. You know, go on, <laughs> you know, with my life. Another thought pops up. Oh, you know, I harmed my children. Then. Oh, forget about that. I try it. my best, you know, and I go on with my life like that. This is how we finish up acting in our life generally, is these little thoughts pop up. Those little thoughts are the beginning of our awakening to the law of compensation. Now, whether you're here or whether you're in the spirit world, you are going to have to experience the results of every single action you took. Right? Now, most of us don't do that here because we ignore the results of most of the actions we took. So what we need to do is come to allow the results to hit us in their full emotional force. Remember, this is an emotional process that's going to hit us in their full emotional force. So I'll go through feelings of you know, shame and then probably deeper feelings, and I'll actually grieve what I did. I will go into a state of grieving, which is actually a state of repentance. Uh, a A N C A N C. Right, we go into a state of repentance, and in that state of repentance, we are now grieving what we did. We are coming to a full knowledge emotionally of the things we've done to harm others. Now, in that state, that is a beautiful time to call upon God, because there's an emotion in response that if you call upon God and you long to God. There's an emotion that God gives in response to your repentance. And that emotion is this misused term, grace or mercy. So rather than, actually, rather than you now having to experience the full results of the law of compensation, because you're in a state of repentance, because you're feeling the emotion of repentance, God, through this mechanism of longing for her love, will give you mercy or grace and you'll feel a feeling of peace overcome you about the situation. And in fact, when you feel that feeling of peace overcome you about the situation, you will know in your heart that you have forgiven yourself for the particular issue that you faced and you've done it emotionally, by the way. This is not an intellectual process. It's an emotional process where you forgive yourself. You've now forgiven yourself for what is done because you can feel... God's forgiveness work through you, through this action of repentance. This is, by the way, one of the highest laws of the universe, believe it or not. When you, when you enact this repentance from, a heart, from the heart, you call into being a high law that actually overcomes the law of compensation. And what this law does this is the law of mercy or grace, or you could think of it the law of divine love, which is the biggest laws of the universe, what it happens is through that law, God then actually helps take away from you the underlying pain of the results of your actions. Now, if that didn't occur, you would have to experience exactly the pain you created. Now, imagine if we're talking about an abortion. I just described some of the pains that an aborted child goes through. If you don't go through the process of repentance, you will have to go through the process of law of compensation. And the process of the law of compensation is exactly what you have dealt out is what will be dealt to you in pain. Does that make sense? That's one of the laws of the universe. But the law of grace or mercy, which is invoked through the law of repentance, overcomes the law of compensation. So as long as you're willing to go through that process, you can very rapidly deal with this problem or this problem of what we've done that's disharmonious with love. When we go through that, we'll come out the other side feeling a sense of peace. You'll be able to talk freely with anyone about that particular issue without crying. Right? And you'll be able to actually mention it in public without feeling ashamed. 
when you fully process yourself through that emotion and feel the foot repentance fully. And this is how many spirits who are now in the celestial world can come to you and tell you all the bad things they did while they were on earth and know that they've been forgiven for all of those things. Does that make sense? So with regard to abortion, it's the same process as the regard to anything else that we've really done harmful in our life. You see, everything we've done harmful in our life, we had our reasons <laughs> at the time, which were really in the end just justifications. We always had a reason why. If we list those reasons why, they will tell us our fears. Can you see it's the same pattern? They will tell us our fears. Our fear was we were willing to, instead of destroy life, break, destroy life, we were willing to break love because of our fears and we will need to feel some grief about those things. Right? When we feel the grief, and remember the grief is regarding the causal reason why we did those things, they are released from us. We will have guilt about everything that we've done that broke love because that's an automatic reaction to the soul. The law of compensation kicks into effect every time we do something disharmonious with love, whether it's natural love or divine love, doesn't matter. The law of compensation will kick into effect. We have the choice of feeling the full effects of the law of compensation or we can go into a state of repentance. The state of repentance is this deep heartfelt sorrow and desire to deal with the underlying causal emotional reason why I did what I did. When we do that and we ask God for grace and mercy, the underlying reason will be lifted from us, you'll feel a sense of peace and calm overcome you and you'll be able to speak about these events without any fear, without any sadness, without any shame, without any terror, without any guilt. Does that make sense? Exactly the same process for everything we do that is disharmonious with God's love. So I wanted to go through that with you because um, this is a part of how divine love works, if you like. And what a lot of the spirits in the spirit world don't understand is these laws. You see, they understand the law of compensation. In the spirit world, it's called the law of karma a lot, right? They understand that law a lot. And they feel the effects of what you sow, you reap. There's a saying in the spirit world that the wheels of God, of God grind very closely. You know, like you know, when you're grinding flour, if you've ever seen a flour mill, you know, you get a seed and a seed and it gets grown and ground, ground and then it goes into a powder. That's what God's laws are like. They're going to grind every error out of you. Right? One way or the other. My suggestion is be wholly involved in the process and it will be the shortest possible process for you. If you're not wholly involved in the process, the law of compensation, the law of attraction, the law of cause and effect and all these other laws will kick into play and it will be a slow, long-winded, painful process for you. It's up to you. The laws of God grind and grind and grind. God has cleverly constructed her universe. Right? It's not like man, you know, you go along to man, you know, you, you go along and say, oh, but you're on it. You know, I did it because I was crazy at the time. Right? It's not like that. It's not like that with God. You can't do things like that with God. God knows what you did and what you were feeling at the time. You can't get away with it. None of God's laws let you get away with anything unless there is repentance, unless there is this feeling. Now, you can see that that is a very, very similar teaching to a lot of Christian teachings, right? For any of you who have been in a Christian religion. Yes, of course, you know, like... That's why it's called Christian, based on Christ, and I was the first Christ, so therefore, you know, a lot of the things I say will sound Christian. Sorry about that, you know. But that's what you get, talking to Jesus. The truth is, the truth is that this is a big law of the universe, that it's really important for you to understand. And if you understand it, you can work through emotions much more rapidly when you understand that particular law. So if we can... Have Mary's comment, and then we'll have someone up the back with a mic. I just wanted to. I, I don't. I haven't been in a Christian faith, yep. but um, 
I wanted to make the point that this repentance is a very emotional place. Yeah. It's not something... Um, it's not like I deathbed have, repentance. Yeah, I have tried to be repentant, but it's a very different place to actually feeling true repentance. Yeah, perhaps you can explain the difference between you trying to be and feeling it. Can you think of any examples? I thought, yeah. Um, there's been lots of times where I've uh, felt like I'm really sorry and I want to say sorry and I'm crying and oh, I never want to do it and I feel ashamed of what I've done. And then the um, next time an event comes and up, then, what happened? I uh, just did it again. Just got angry or just, you know, cut someone off or, or whatever. And then I felt shame. And, so, and this is why guilt is such a um, powerful avoidance emotion because it wasn't letting me get deeper mm -hmm. to to the actual reasons why I was taking these actions. Yeah. When I did that, I actually felt um, I really connected to what it was I was avoiding through trying to control or trying to... So I felt the reason why I was actually taking the action, getting angry, for example. Mm -hmm. And I felt... So I felt that I really connected with that and felt grief about that, but I also felt a, a very deep longing towards God of a really please take this away from my soul so yeah. I, uh, it's not so within do me it anymore. Again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can everyone see that you can say sorry as much as you like, but if you do it again, you weren't sorry in the first place. Right? So, you know, you see this a lot in a relationship, for example. The man cheats on the wife, says he's sorry, cries, does all these other things, you know, and, and she thinks, oh, he seems like he's sorry. You know, six months later, he's cheating again. Like, was he sorry? No. What is real sorrow? Real sorrow is connecting to the causal emotional reason why you did what you did. That's real sorrow. A very important thing to understand, if, particularly in a relationship, because if, if you're wanting to get back with a partner who's harmed you in some way, like let's say we've got an abusive situation with a partner where the partner's maybe, you know, yelling and screaming at you all the time or maybe even hurting you, like physically hurting you all the time. Unless that person who's hurt doing that deals with the underlying causal emotional reason why they do what they do, they are going to do it again. Guaranteed. If we deal with the underlying causal reason why we do it, we will not ever be able to do it again. It will be so abhorrent for us to even consider doing it again emotionally that we would never be able to do it again. Does that make sense? And that's not a fear of it. You get to a point where you just cannot do it. Can you say more? I, it and then was, we're asking. Yeah. No, it was just uh, you were explaining that process in, with regards to abortion. Yep. And I just wanted to make the point that once the parents reach this place of repentance, then the... Um, the, their children, child, yeah. the child that's been aborted, can actually then have a relationship with them. Yeah. 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 You see, the reason why is that a child can reconnect, or to be honest, anybody can reconnect with a person who's repentant. So it doesn't matter what's happened in your life, but if a person's repentant, they're never going to do that same thing again to you. And so every single person on this planet, every single person in the spirit world can reconnect to people who have harmed them, tortured them, abused them, and all sorts of things, as long as the person who was the perpetrator is completely repentant and they've dealt with the underlying causal emotion. So you understand that when you deal with the underlying causal emotion, it creates an amazing draw back to a pure relationship with the person. And this is a particular the case with an abortion. So the child who's aborted feels a draw back to mummy and daddy when mummy and daddy are repentant for the reasons why they did what they did. And the, the, the nursing spirit, if the child's still quite young, will allow that process to occur under those circumstances because that's in harmony with God's laws. What I wanted to ask, AJ, with that example that you've put on the board, mm -hmm. you talked about listing the reasons why. Aren't I going to be in my intellect if I do that rather than actually in the emotion? Yeah, but see, your justifications are always based on emotional reasons. So your intellectual justifications always have an emotional cause. So someone mentioned to me in a break that one of their justifications was at the time was this justification that I won't have enough money to care for our child. Right? So that was an, a justification. There's a deep emotional reason in that justification. Lack of abundance or worry that God's not going to provide. All sorts of emotional reasons might be in that justification. 
And this is why I say start with your justifications if you're having trouble getting to your fears and your grief. Because if you start with them, you'll be able to easily identify what the underlying fears are for those justifications. Remember, every emotional justification you have is based on a fear that you have of something occurring. So it's great if you can list them. So for example, my justification, for example, for not doing bigger groups, right, is that I, I feel that I'm not ready for doing bigger groups. Does that make sense? That's my justification. But actually, it's an avoidance. The real fear is that in, when I'm in a bigger group, I will get more projections of, uh, of condescension, more projections of judgment, more projections of unworthiness and so forth that I don't want to feel. That's my fear. Does that make sense? So you will find these things in every single thing you do. Many of you feel like a pull to teaching people whatever you've learned. And then you tell yourself a justification, which is, ah, oh, you know, I don't like big crowds. That's a justification. That covers the fear. What's the fear? Fear of big crowds is something to do with how you'll be treated in a big crowd, how you'll be looked upon, how you'll be judged and so forth. Work your way through that and then step underneath. Does that make sense? We can go over there with a the mic. Uh, Thank you, AJ. Forgiveness. There's a lot of talk of forgiveness, mm -hmm. disempowering the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. How does that fit in with repentance? You were saying when you repent, the other person, is that automatic forgiveness then because you've repented or does it need? No, forgiveness isn't something you do for yourself, not for the other person, for a start. Let's look at forgiveness. Forgiveness is a part of a lot of our understandings about God and it's something very important. I've talked about forgiveness in the past for three or four hours at a time, so there is stuff, some stuff on the net about forgiveness already that you can listen to. But here's a general summary. What does God do? The instant you break one of God's laws of love, you are forgiven. God doesn't demand it of you, anything of you. God doesn't even demand that you're sorry. God still forgives you. Now, you might not forgive yourself, or you may. A lot of times we think we've forgiven ourselves, but in reality all we've done is justified our actions. That's not forgiveness. Right? But from God's perspective, God forgives every single action. So if a murderer comes along and murders your family... God will forgive them, instant, the instant that it happened. But there is this law of compensation. And the law of compensation is what you sow, you reap. The law of compensation is there's going to be an effect for every action you take. So therefore, even though God's forgiven you, there is a consequence of the laws you've broken. And they will have to be, those consequences will have to be paid by your soul, basically. Now let's look at that in the sense of a relationship. Let's say or, or a parent-child relationship where the father abused the daughter. If the father abuses the daughter, the daughter needs to get to a state of forgiveness before she can move on from that damage. And it's not an intellectual pace. It's not, I've heard so many people come up to me and say, look, I've been abused as a child, but I've forgiven my dad now. And I'm saying, I'm sorry, but you haven't yet actually, because to forgive someone completely, you've got to actually feel the underlying emotions they created through their interaction with you, inside of you. And you need to feel them and release them. And then you've forgiven them. So when you forgive them, what happens is this. When you forgive them, there is an automatic feeling inside of you now that you can love them even though they did those things. All right? Now you think with some pretty hard actions like abuse, for example, that's going to take a bit of effort in your part, isn't it, to work your way through the process of forgiveness. Now forgiveness, what that does is a number of things for yourself. What it does is it allows you now to no longer have any emotional response to the action they took towards you. Now, 
I'm not saying you manufacture that state. It's got to be a real state in you that you no longer have any emotional response to the action someone took, about, took towards you. When you're in that state and you forgive, from that moment you can move forward on that issue. It is no longer an issue tying up your life and, ch and, doing, and changing your life. But you know what happens on earth and in the spirit world a lot? We only forgive if someone's sorry and even then we have a hard time, right? But let's say we wait to forgive until somebody is truly repentant. The problem with that is this. If I wait until a murderer who murdered my family is sorry for what he did to my family, I am going to be waiting a long time, which actually locks my own relationship up with God and my family by the event. Because remember, my family is now in the spirit world and I could still be having a relationship with them that is perfectly loving. So what happens is this. When I decide to not forgive, what I'm doing is I'm now basically basing my entire spiritual progression on the other person coming to a realisation of what they did. Now, do you think if you're a murderer, you're going to easily come to a realisation of what you did? as wrong? Well, you, if, you, if you were going to easily come to it, you wouldn't even word it in the first place, probably, would you? Can you see that? So, if you lock your life up, waiting for the people who hurt you to be sorry, you will not ever be at one with God and you'll never experience the beautiful emotions that come in that state. You won't experience the freedom that comes from forgiving yourself, you know, forgiving them and forgiving yourself. So my suggestion is to allow yourself, now there's been long discussions that I have about forgiveness and how it takes place and we just did one recently I think, didn't we? So that's on the net and you can download that and have a listen to that. So there's whole discussions about forgiveness and repentance and interactions and so forth and love and self-love all in that discussion. So my suggestion is to have a look at that. But in summary, if a person doesn't forgive, they are basically locking up their own spiritual progression and their own bliss. You are just harming yourself. And uh, I've talked to many spirits who are in this state. We, uh, we had a group of slave spirits come to us once and their slave owners, this was in Barbados, and their slave owners, this was like 300, 400 years ago that they had been in this state. They were still in the hells of the first fear the spirits who were tortured by the slave owners were in the hells. The slave owners were in the hells deeper again. But the spirits who were tortured by the slave owners were still in the hells and they didn't understand why. When we talked to them, I started helping them connect to the emotions they had towards the slave owners, which were emotions of rage and, and they, just, what they wanted to do to the slave owners what the slave owners did to them. They wanted to punish the slave owners by doing exactly the same things. We actually helped them with a few spirits, helped them go to the slave owners and where they were to look at their condition. And they came back and said, I'm glad they were in that condition. So they were really, really angry. They were full of rage. What we did was we connected them to their rage and started telling them that that's why they are where they were, because they were still in the rage and they hadn't forgiven now, as soon as they connected that, they asked, what about, how do I forgive? I said, all you need to do is feel the grief you felt having these things done to you. And as soon as I said that, lots and lots of them started to go into their memories about the damage that was done to them. And instead of being in a rage about them, just allowed their grief to just flow out of them. And then I asked them to just long to God for God's love to come to them. And every single one of them, every single one of them moved from the first sphere to the second sphere in that one transaction, just by doing that once. Now those ones are now quite high up in the spirit world. This was two years ago that this happened because they've learnt some of the other lessons of divine love in the process and are now progressing on the divine love path. But understand that what was holding them there for 300 or so years was their state of rage and anger towards the perpetrator. 
And so it's a very powerful thing to give up rage and anger towards perpetrators. It does not mean you'll allow them back in your life until they are repentant. Because when they are repentant, they will never be able to hurt you again. Their soul wouldn't allow it. I was just wondering if I could just go back to that abortion where mm-hmm. you were talking about um, the forgiveness with the, both parents. Yep. Um, how does that, um, how's that situation with rape? Um, with rape, obviously um, there are a number of things going on with rape. Um, of course, the person who's the rapist needs to go through this process. <laughs> okay. Anyway, let's have a look at rape. Now, please don't think then in all of these discussions about the law of attraction that I'm actually justifying the sin. Remember I said the sin is the missing the mark of God's love. Remember I said that? The sin, what the sin is, is when I do something disharmonious with the way God would do it. That's basically the sin. So the rapist is sinning, is he not? He is doing something that if he was in harmony with God's love, he would never be able to do. So that's the important thing to understand, is that everything that's done in disharmony with love is something that we would never be able to do if we were harmonious with love. And there is an automatic law of compensation effect on that particular person. So if I'm a rapist and I, and I haven't dealt with the emotions that caused me to rape on the earth, in the spirit world, once I work my way through it, there would be a whole group of emotions I would need to deal with. Does that make sense? In the spirit world. Now, let's look at the rape in the sense of what's actually happening. There's one soul on earth who's let's say it's the male perpetrator. Right? He's the perpetrator of the rape. He has a group of emotions. Passions, desires, that have been distorted through the error beliefs that have entered him emotionally from his childhood. Then we have the, in this case we'll say, the soul of the female victim. Shall we call her a victim at this stage? The victim of the crime. She has a set of emotions, passions, desires, And many of those emotions and passions and desires are also influenced by error, right? which causes her law of attraction. Remember, it's our soul condition that causes our law of attraction. This male, due to these emotions, believes in his heart, he feels emotionally that that actually raping a woman is a justifiable thing to do. That's what he believes. He wouldn't do it if he didn't believe it. So he believes, because of the group of emotions in him, that it's justifiable to actually have sex with a woman against her will. So he has quite a lot of emotional damage, doesn't he? He doesn't believe in the law of free will, for example, does he? Because if he did, he couldn't do that. He obviously has these emotional damages. If he's, if he's going to rape a female, these emotional errors are related to his mother in particular, or women figures in his life, in his childhood. Does that make sense? Now, this female may have certain emotional errors errors in her regarding men in her life that cause this male who is now in such a state emotionally that he is looking for the woman he can rape on a daily basis, really. And as soon as he feels it, and usually, of course, there is a whole group of spirits connected with this now. His law of attraction is now we've got spirits surrounding him, male spirits who are surrounding him, who also have this same belief. And by the way, 
there are literally millions of those in the spirit world who believe rape is justifiable, still in the spirit world, in the hells of the spirit world, in dark places. So he, they look for a man who has the set of emotions that has the same kind of set of emotions they have towards women. Can you see that? So there's a law of attraction going on here which heightens his emotions. And he now, with their help, is looking for a woman and a situation by which they can harm the woman and rape her. So he goes ahead and once he finds that woman who has a certain set of emotional conditions in her, by the way, I'm not blaming her for that. It's, he's the perpetrator here. He's the one acting disharmonious with love here, right? When as he finds her, he will rape her for certain. Right? Now, what has to happen to fix it is probably the question. Well, one thing that can help the woman fix it, if she's been raped, is to actually deal with the underlying emotional things within her that causes these spirits to identify her as a potential choice to be raped. And in there, there will be some fears that she have about men. And many of those fears will have come from her childhood. Does that make sense? And in, this is why many women who are raped have also had some sexual abuse in their childhood from men. Because there is a correlation between those two events that created fear in her and other emotions that she's yet to release. So she can actually work her way through the causal emotions that created the attraction. She can release that within herself and work through those emotions. And they will be related not only just to the event now, which would be a very damaging event, but also the underlying emotions. I'm talking about the childhood emotions. She needs to allow herself to actually deal with an experience. When she deals with an experience, that experience, she will no longer feel anger, resentment or anything else towards men generally or towards even the man who raped her. Now, my soulmate in the first century experienced many rapes. So Mary has the experience of having to work her way through those sets of emotions. Now the man, he passes in a very, very terrible condition or if he's on the earth, he's in a very terrible condition. And uh, he, the only way we're going to be able to help him is for, to connect him to these emotions inside of him about his mother and about women in his life and how angry he feels and powerless he feels around women and so forth. He needs to connect with a lot of powerless emotions and grieving emotions around women. And he will need to work through every one of those emotions plus all of the emotions related to damaging the law of free will plus all of the pain that he created in the woman, plus all of those things. He's going to need to work through every one of those things emotionally. He can do that with God or he can do it using the law of compensation. Many of them don't do it with God for a long time. So they pass into the spirit world and for many hundreds and sometimes thousands of years they remain in that state until they actually begin doing it with God. Is there any more you want to know about that particular scenario? Any questions? It was about the abortion from the rape. All right, well, let's, said, look, let's go to this person now having a child. And you said that um, to clear it, you had to, the both people had to clear it. But Well, no, in this situation, he would have all of his emotions, which, by the way, are going to be terribly difficult and long-winded to deal with, but he won't have to deal with the fact that she had an abortion because that was her choice. She will need to deal with the fact that she had an abortion. And so she will need to work through the emotional fears just in the way that I've just ex explained in the previous set. And that will be a fear, you know, a fear that every time she looks at this child, all she remembers is the event. That's the primary reason why this lady would have an abortion. Does that make sense? The primary reason she'd have an abortion is because she's worried that every time she looks at the child, she would remember the event. She doesn't want to remember the event. So the key for her is to allow herself, because she's going to need to allow herself to remember the event, to deal with all the emotions of the event and then connect with the underlying emotions too within herself and what's going on for herself in that particular situation. 
she will need to look at this issue of aborting a child. But she will, again, it will be through the fear of every... It's the fear of her own emotion in the end, isn't it, that caused her to abort the child, really, in the end? The fear that every time she looks at the child, all she'll see is the event or the perpetrator. If she deals with her emotions causally, which is difficult, but can, it, it can be done and, and many, many... Obviously, there's been many hundreds of millions, billions of women who have been raped historically. Right? And, there, and so there is lots of women in the spirit world that have dealt with these emotions. And all of them know that you can deal with these emotions. By the way, the same applies if a male has been raped, but that's not as, pop, not as a common occurrence because the male has a physical body that's stronger generally. But can you see there's always these relationships between what's going on? Now, of course, from God's perspective, her, her causal emotions for aborting this child are a lot different to a couple in a loving relationship deciding to abort the child. Do you see what I'm saying? The couple in the loving relationship who decide to abort the child will have more emotions to work through about the abortion than this lady would. Can you see why? Because it, it was all imposed, you know, there's a lot of things going on in this compared to the, to, to the couple who's in the loving relationship. So, so and, and the truth is that God knows every single thing right down to the bone of it. No, I don't. Right? And so all I'm doing is presenting to you scenarios that I've observed in my life of different people who've had to go through these emotions. God knows each individual circumstance and situation and the individual emotions involved with every single thing. And this is why your relationship with God is of paramount importance. Because it's through that relationship everything can be healed in the most easy, most, the, the most easy ways compared to doing it all yourself. I'm just wondering, say um, it was a rape situation and there was no abortion, the child was born, mm -hmm. does that child take on the soul injuries from the father and the mother? Yes. As, so that child would then have to work through all the, the father's... Well, because the father was just there in an instant, uh, it was only the instant he was present, if conception occurred, that, they, that the emotional injury would come from the father. Does that make sense? So in comparison to the emotional injuries that would come from the mother, there's a fair wide difference between the two states. So the majority of the child's emotional injuries would come from the mother and its environment. But it, it would be far better if the mother could allow the child to be born and even have the child give up for adoption rather than actually terminate the child for her soul condition. Um, the other problem we have nowadays on earth is that we judge people terribly when mothers give up children. Right? We have this terrible judgment towards a mother giving up a child. But whose child is it again? God's child. Yeah, that's right. So if we keep that in mind, we will no longer stop we will stop judging mothers and start looking at this child needed giving the best possible care that we can give it. Does that make sense? So we'll stop judging the mother. We will start actually looking at how we can help this child be loved. And if the mother says to us, I'm not capable of loving it, and then two years later says, now I am, I'd be perfectly happy with that. I, you know, I wouldn't ask them to sign away their life, giving away their child, and then two years later when they feel sorry that they've done that, come back and I say to them, I'm sorry now, you can't have your child. You're like, oh, it's my child now. Now, if we all had the viewpoint that this wasn't our child, would we ever get into a situation like that? No, we wouldn't, you see. I would, I would actually say to them, by all means, you know, look after your child. Have you dealt with some of these emotions, though? Because they're going to affect your child. Do you know what I mean? So, so the truth is with everything is to allow yourself to deal with the emotion. In the case of uh, the child being born, then obviously, yes, the mum's emotion will affect the child. So it would be very, very good if the mum's emotions could be dealt with even during her pregnancy because that, that will help her a lot to, you know, that helps the child. Don't feel that you're harming your child dealing with a causal emotion during your pregnancy. You're actually harming your child when you suppress your causal emotions during your pregnancy. Right? 
Because remember, when you suppress all of your emotions, that's when the majority of the emotions fly out to the universe. It's when you own your emotions completely, now less of your emotions are flying out to the universe doing harm to everyone else. So the more you deal within yourself, the less damage there is to, to others. <laughs> Go ahead. I just ask another question. Um, just based on ancestral trauma, you know, things get passed down on a physical level, say like a disease or a... Yep. You know, and I know you've talked about spirit attachments that have been with generational families for, you know, like diabetes and things like that. Yep. Because um, in my line of work, I, I do a lot of healing work with ancestral, releasing ancestral trauma. And yep. so when I'm going into the conception point and seeing the mother... I can actually go in and see the mother's trauma and the father's trauma. Yep. Or feel it. Why not see it? Feel it. Yep. And so as I'm going through and sharing with the client all the things that come up, mm -hmm. they're going, oh my God, that's my life. I've lived that out. I've lived that out. And Spot that's on. that's manifesting. So as we're clearing it, can you clear it and then have them actually have the consciousness that that's there and then release the emotion? Not for them, but... So I guess um, what I'm trying to say, does the client have to literally go through every single emotion that they've taken on the parent, or is it just enough to just have the consciousness and feel it on the table and then that's released, or is it... No, okay. No. <laughs> um, however, remember the principles of grace apply to every emotion. So when the person has the desire to experience the causal emotion inside of themselves, and they ask God for God's assistance to deal with these multi-generational emotions, God can then reach in and actually, because the emotion is flowing, it's a bit like this. Here's our soul, if I describe it like this. Here's our soul. Here's the emotion that's inside of me from my parents. Let's say it's from my mum in this case, right? Now, now, my free will means that if I have my free will totally open and expressive, everything, as Mary said earlier, will pass through me. Does that make sense? So this emotion would already be out of me if I'd done that, if I'm exercising my free will. Now, the problem with our free will is you can think of your free will as a cap over your soul. Right? When you don't want to use your free will to do something, what you're doing is putting like a shell on your soul, it's a shell on your emotions. Now, to, for God to reach in, you think of God's hand, if you can think of a hand reaching in to try and grip this emotion. If you've got a shell on top, what can God do now? Nothing. right? Because to do it would be to break one of her own rules, and that is, I don't want to do anything that you don't want me to do. Can you see? Right? So, so while I'm exercising my free will to block my relationship with God and to block the experience of this emotion, God can't actually reach in and help grab this emotion out of me. Right? But if I allow, I open up my soul and allow myself to experience the emotion, the potential of the experience even, now my soul is open and God can just, because it's flowing, God can grab it because the emotion is now flowing in me and I'm not preventing it through my own denial. So you can see very much it depends upon our will as to how fast we can release cause and emotion. Another thing I need to say though is that there are two things you cannot do for another person. One of them is release their emotion. You will never, ever, ever be able to release another person's emotion. And when I say two things, like I could think of a whole list of things, but there's two primary things. And in releasing the emotion, I mean also desire. You cannot do something that someone else desires for them. So that, you know, they can only experience their desires. You can act on it, but you'll be doing it for emotional reasons that you're denying inside of yourself. The second thing that you will never be able to do for another person is give them God's love. So every time, you know, you put your hands on someone and invoke God's love to come through you into the other person, it's not God's love going through you into the other person. Because only God can connect to the person and give God's love to the person. 
So what's actually happening? Because that's that's been a bit of a dilemma for me. Because I've you know done healing work for eight years now, and over mm -hmm. that time, kind of come through theta healing and all the the new age stuff, and found so, quite a lot of frustration with that because. Yep. So what's going on? We want to know. Yeah. Okay. Let's have a look at what's going on. Here's your soul. Here's the soul of the person you're trying to assist, right? right? So here's your soul, here's God. And surrounding you, there are lots of spirits, right? Particularly if you're doing healing, there are lots of spirits around you surrounding your healing process. By the way, around this person, there's probably some spirits as well, right? Some of them who want to help the person are the ones who perhaps want to harm the person. In each healing situation, lots of different things are going on. There might be spirits connected to the person who are actually causing the person's ailment. So if you ask them to leave or you ask God's love to enter them, that will actually ask them to leave in most cases. And so what will happen is God's love, if this person is open, can enter the person and actually help disconnect them from the spirit. Now that will look like an instantaneous healing for that person. A very successful day that day, you know, right? And so their, their, their stuff goes away quite rapidly under those circumstances. Next week they might come along with a different problem because they haven't yet healed the emotion that caused the attraction to the spirit that was harming them. But that's a different story altogether. The other thing that's happening is when you do some healing work with the person, the spirits that are with you or with them that are in a good condition they might not be on the divine love path, but they might be in a good condition, like one of their guides or guardians, will actually do whatever they can to help the person heal. Now, if those spirits are on the divine love path, they won't do that until this person is willing to deal with the emotion. But if the spirits are on the natural love path, they will use as much of your energy as possible to do as much healing on this person. The ectoplasm of your body is used to actually work through, the spirit works through it because you're the one with the connection that works through it. They can't often connect to this person because this person's like, you know, quite often in a sad state or whatever, and so they're not connecting to that person. But usually the person who's a healer is quite a good medium, so they're basically channeling energy, healing energy from spirits via themselves to that person. But they're not doing it to their soul. That's the problem. They're usually doing it to their spirit body and their physical body. Now, remember I've said that every single problem we have is caused by the souls, not the bodies. So we can channel a lot of healing to a body, helps them for a week or two weeks or a few months, but then they say, oh, look, I'm coming back and a few months later I've really got the same problem, you know, like... I was really good for a couple of months. Right? You hear that a lot when you're doing healing. The reason why is because they're still not identifying the causal emotion. Now, a spirit on the celestial, yeah, a celestial spirit or a spirit on the, on the divine love path would actually still do that, but only if they saw a willingness in the person to deal with the emotion. So in other words, when you're on a, in, a, in a, a love state, you know when a person's got that eggshell across the top of their soul, if you like, right? And you can feel it from them. Like I can feel it from many of you when you come up to ask me a question. And I go, mm, you don't want to deal with that. And I'll say that to you. And you say, yes, I do. Yes, I do. How dare you say to me I don't, you know? And I say, well, I'm sorry, but I feel you don't. I can feel that eggshell that's on the top there, you know? <laughs> Whatever that eggshell is. And I'll try and encourage you to get into that one. Um, but a lot of times we don't want to know what that is because we're afraid or whatever and so we don't deal with that. But when you're a spirit, you can see it. You can see it affecting the spirit body of the person so you know there's resistance. Now when there's resistance like that, a natural love spirit can heal through you as the, as the this is the healer's soul, if you like. You're the healer. A natural love spirit can heal through you, but you're not going to heal the entire thing. You can't because the emotion's creating it while you're trying to undo it. Right? And this is why a lot of people like who have cancers, for example, go along to a healer, get lots of healing every week, they feel better for a day or so, and then, but eventually the cancer kills them. And the reason why is because they are not dealing with the underlying emotional reasons why. And the emotional reasons are more powerful than the healing. 
And because the emotional reasons are more powerful than the healing, the condition degrades. So all you do is slow down the condition if you don't deal with the emotion, but you never actually heal the condition in the person. Except, of course, in the original thing that I said, if it was a spirit causing the condition, you can heal that really rapidly. And that's why you have these effects sometimes that are really rapid. Now, on the divine love path, if this person has the faith to connect to God and also has the desire to experience all of their emotion, which is called humility, so they have the humility to connect to their emotion, now God can direct connect to them directly. And that's going to be a pretty powerful experience. So you've only got them on the table. They're opening up to God. They're opening up their faith that God will actually connect with them and help them here. And they're humble to experience all the emotions. You can spend a two minutes with them and say one word or two words or a sentence and all of a sudden they're bawling their eyes out on the table having a major causal emotional release. And that's a very powerful experience because that's really good for them. Eventually what was hap happening though is we want to teach them all to do it for themselves, of course, rather than having your... But as a healer, this is one of the roles you can have, is it teaching people how to heal themselves. So in that situation, God is actually giving them divine love during that process directly. You have helped them by telling them the truth. Remember I've said there's three things we need to connect to God. What were they? A love for a longing for divine love, a longing for divine truth, and humility. So we've helped them come to a state of humility by talking to them about their emotion. You're allowed to have your emotion. You're allowed to experience your emotion, so forth. We've talked to them about the truth, the truth that we know our spirit friends might be telling us. Oh, in your life, you were abused by your father, and this is how you felt at the time. Do you remember that? That's the truth entering them. They're longing for God's love, and they have faith that it's going to help heal them they will definitely get healed from whatever that is if they do those three things. Then it's a very, very powerful experience for the person and also for the healer. It's a joyful experience because you, you can feel lots of things changing. Yeah. So the key is to change our, if we're a healer, to change our focus a little from just trying to fix the problem externally into fixing the cause of the problem so the problem can be fixed internally. And that's the powerful thing we can do as a healer. Remember that God only deals with causes. There's a law of cause and effect, which I haven't discussed yet with people. God will only address causes in your soul. He doesn't address effects. So if you say to God, oh, please take away, away this uh, malignant cancer from me, God will not do that. You try that. God won't do that. For you. Many people have tried that, right, and have died with their cancer. Many religious people have tried that and died with their cancer, by the way. You know that, don't you, through your own experience and things you've heard. Why hasn't it worked? They've had faith in God. They've had the humility, maybe, to experience their emotions. But what's going on? They're not addressing the cause. You see, we've got to address the cause. We've got to be willing to address the cause whatever that cause is. Sometimes the causes aren't too pl pretty. Sometimes the causes are actually, oh, wow, I've got this terrible emotion where I'd like to harm other people in me. And that might be the cause, and you've got to come to deal with that cause. Often that's the case with cancers. That's one of the causes, like a big desire to impact our life on other people. You'll see this happening a lot surrounding those kind of diseases. And so often, unless we're willing to address the causes, God can't be involved in the process. Also, because we're unwilling to address the causes, any celestial spirits or spirits on the divine love path can't be involved in the process. Because they keep their connection with God by having their harmony with all of God's laws. Does that make sense? They can't. So the only spirits that can help in that situation are natural love spirits. And the natural love spirits don't understand the soul, right? Most of them haven't even learnt about the soul yet. They think the soul is a spirit body. Like, so when you talk to many people on earth and people in the, in the spirits in the natural love community, I suppose you could call it, if we can call it that, you'll find that many of them have this viewpoint that, that oh, my spirit body is my soul. 
And that's why they call it the spirit. But it's not your soul. It's a completely different thing. But they believe it's the same thing. So they don't even know what the soul is, and therefore they don't even know what the cause is. All they do is see it in the spirit body, but they don't identify with the cause emotionally in the soul. Now there's spirits who are on the natural life path who are starting to do that now, of course, and that's why we're getting a lot of emotional work coming into a lot of the healing now. Whereas right back at the beginning it was all sort of metaphysical work, you know, work with the spirit form. But now it's a lot more emotional. But even so, there's a lot of laws involved in terms of how powerful we can be as the healer. And if we understand them, it can work really well every time. Yeah. Does that answer? Sometimes my answers seem a bit long, I know. But it's fairly concise. Concise enough? <laughs> With the uh, mediumship and healing sessions that we're doing now, um, what, what we'll be doing is going through in practice a lot of healing techniques in terms of what we would do in different circumstances and situations to help a person heal and using very, like a lot of healers know all of the different techniques of kinesiology, reflexology and all these other ologies that we have here on earth and, and we can use a lot of those techniques in actually helping a person connect to God and work their way through the emotion and have faith and all those different things that are the real primary things. But down the track, once I'm in the condition and then others of the 14 and others of, others of you are in the condition of one with God, you'll be healing in an entirely different manner um, because all those ologies you won't need anymore because God will be able to operate through you and you'll know exactly what to do in each situation with each person to actually help their causal emotions to be released. And so um, when we're in that state, which was the state that I demonstrated in the first century too, there'll be lots of people taking a lot more notice of the divine love path at that point. And mm. um, if we come down to Ray and then back up. Uh, it's all right, just if you... AJ, I came here this weekend with a burning question, yep. and it's about your journey. And Whose journey? Yours or mine? Yours. Mine, okay. Yours. Yep. And um, I just want to know, I know you had a, a regular life before where you were working and all the rest of it. Did you just like wake up one morning and know you were Jesus, or how did that happen? <laughs> Um, it's a good question. It's, it's funny that lots of, lots of people have never asked me this question, even though I say I'm Jesus, right? So I find it interesting how many people don't ask questions about the question about whether I'm Jesus or not. But anyway, all right, let me describe what happened. It's going to be a summary, all right? So it's obviously there's a lot of emotions involved in this summary. Um, when I was, shortly after I was born, I was born with a lot of physical problems. So I had a lot of fear in my body and uh, those fear, the fears in my body caused a lot of problems, particularly in this region of my body. And as a result of that, uh, obviously I had some operations uh, on my bow and a few other things when I was very, very young. I was a couple of years, a couple of years old. The fear has been with me all my life that fear and um, it's only just started to be released from 13 years ago onwards. But what happened was when I was quite young and I could start having, you know, you know how when you grow you start having your own memories, I would have memories of different things happening, memories of abuse mostly, uh, which I couldn't understand at all. And uh, by the time I was around, around 12 years of age, I'd blocked off all of those memories. So I'd done very, very similar to what an abuse victim would do with torture or, or um, sexual abuse. Just block it all off. So I actually remember we're sitting down one day when I was 12. I was in the backyard at, uh, at a town in my hometown that I was born in Loxton in South Australia. And I knew from that moment I'd never remember. This is how I felt. I'd never remember my childhood. Many of you don't remember your childhood, right? Still. And there's good reasons for that, that you need to investigate, right? Because, you, because there's emotions locked up in that. Anyway, um, when I was seven years of age, um, I've always had a really strong bent towards God, 
always, that all, ever since I can remember. I remember when I was about three or four years of age, sitting in our backyard in a little warm place, patting a cat, longing for God and missing my soulmate. And I was four and I didn't understand any of the emotions of it. Right? And, uh, and so I've always had these connections with my soulmate and God that I couldn't understand. And, uh, and when I was seven, my mother changed religion. She was a, um, Anglican, Church of England. And she went through this big process of, of investigating different religions. But what she did was she compared all the religions with the Bible. How many of you have done that in your life? Like, got out the Bible, a few of you, yeah. Got out the Bible line by line, you know, compared it to that religion. Like, it's a pretty big job, and uh, considering how many pages there are there. But my mother went through this process, and she finished up narrowing da down to three religions that she liked. <laughs> uh, the Seventh-day Adventist religion, the Mormon religion, and the Jehovah's Witness religion. And be the reason why she narrowed down to those three was because she felt that each one of those religions had quite a lot of connection with the Bible, and were practicing the Bible in, in what she had read in the Bible to be. And eventually she studied with each one of those. So she went to uh, you know, the Seven-day Adventists in our hometown, and there wasn't, well, it wasn't many, and she went to the Mormons, in our, well, there weren't any Mormons in her hometown, but they'd visit, and then she went to the Jehovah's Witnesses, and there was uh, no Jehovah's Witnesses in our town either. There was in, one in a town about 30 or 40 miles away. Renmark, for any of you who know South Australia. And uh, anyway, so she went through this process of studying. And after two years of doing that, she, um, she narrowed it down to the Jehovah's Witnesses. So my mother became a Jehovah's Witness. And, uh, and in the Jehovah's Witness faith, it's, uh, there's a lot of focus on the Bible, like re literally reading the Bible and literally applying it. Now, um, what that meant was that I got at a young age, presented with the Bible. Because before then, when my mum was a, uh, um, a Church of England, um, I wasn't interested in reading the Bible at all. And, and in fact, what I would read was my dad's Alistair McLean books, which were, if any of you know, he's sort of like a crime war writer. And by the time I was five years of age, I was reading those books instead, uh, not, not anything to do with the Bible. But still having this longing for God and so forth. And... So what happened then was uh, I started studying the Bible for myself. So I was around seven or eight years of age by now, and I started looking through the Bible, and there were some things that really, really affected me in the Bible. And I couldn't understand why. Sometimes I would cry reading it, and I couldn't understand why. Anyway, that went on, and by the time I was 12, I'd studied the Bible so well that my, I knew the Bible better than my parents. And, uh, and in particular, I'd focused on the prophecies of the Bible. I don't know if you know much about them, uh, but the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, uh, all the books of the, the prophets in the, what are called the Hebrew Scriptures, or the, you might call them the Old Testament. Uh, and I realized that there was a lot of prophecies relating to Messiah and relating to... And I started also co-relating prophecies with real life. And I started feeling myself that the Bible was God's word. So I actually, I can remember going through this feeling that the Bible was God's word. So from then on, I devoted my life to the Jehovah's Witness faith. Right? And so I started knocking on doors, you know, and, uh, and my whole life was focused around it. I knocked on doors started preaching. Many of you feel very confronted by me saying all this, of course, but that's how it was. So I went through all of that, and, um, and by the time I was 16, I just wanted to do the preaching thing full time. So I was one of these pests that came and knocked on your doors, <laughs> <laughs> trying to change your mind, you know. Anyway. So, um, and then of course uh, I met a lady uh, when I was 16 actually, I met a lady and by the time I was 19 I was married to that girl and uh, we had two children and um, we were both in the Jehovah's Witness faith and I became what was called an elder in that faith. So I was up in front of lots of people and eventually up in front of thousands of people. It was one time uh, 5,000 people uh, that I would speak to at a time. So. 
So anyway, I did all of that. I was quite young still. I was now in my late 20s. So I'd moved around a bit and, and uh, still in the faith, but starting to feel quite a lot of emotions about other people's misunderstandings of love. And I noticed a lot of lack of love being displayed. So even though that we were you know, trying to practice the Bible, on the other hand, there was a lot of times that the Bible, as I saw it, wasn't being practiced anyway. And in particular, with regard to the aspect of love, true love, you know, with, for everyone. And, uh, and so I started thinking and speaking a lot about love. And as a result of that, I moved to a new location and, and talked about love a lot. And in the process of moving to the new location, I found that the new location was even more unloving than the place I'd come from. And that just brought up lots and lots of different things for me. And eventually, because I was an elder in the faith, you had this role of policing the congregation. And what I mean by policing was that you, well, it's not so much policing, but whenever somebody in the congregation broke the laws of so-called love, you know, but by now I'm starting to worry about this, but the, by, broke the laws of love, you would actually talk to them. And, and if they continued to want to break the laws of love, you would go through this process with them where eventually if they continued to want to do that, you would remove them from the congregation. Does that make sense? So you would disfellowship them, it was called, or disassociate them. And in the congregation I was in, at the time, there were quite a few drunkards, and the Bible condemns drunkards, you see. So, so that meant that it was my responsibility to deal with this issue, and because I was an elder in the congregation. And in the process of doing that, I went through huge emotions that eventually I had a breakdown. So eventually I had this emotional breakdown. I was 32 years of age um, when I had the breakdown. It was, it was still emotions that I can feel now, you know, just terrible emotions of like not knowing, um, just not being connected to myself anymore, feeling, feeling the terrible anger and hatred that was being projected at me for just following what I believed the Bible was saying I should do in that role. And I finished up stepping down from being an elder in the congregation. And during this time, ironically, that I was going through the breakdown, um, for, if I describe a bit about my personal life, for the previous seven years I knew my wife didn't love me. My wife seven years earlier had fallen in love with another man and uh, although we were still together and she never left me, um, our relationship wasn't the same. And during that time also, uh, there was 13 years where she was depressed in our relationship from almost the time of our first child right the way through our relationship. She was very depressed as well. So I had all those pressures happening in my life and at the same time I had four companies. And I was trying to run these four companies through an emotional breakdown. <laughs> does, that, does it sound sort of like a super achiever type person, right? And it was like that. I was... See, in, in the Jehovah's Witness faith, you don't get paid for doing what you do. So you've still got to earn money using other means. Does that make sense? So I would earn money by doing my computer work in my companies and, and so forth. At this, at this stage, I only had, sorry, not four companies. I had, it's hard to remember with all the companies I've started. Um, yeah, no, actually, I had four companies, sorry. But, but there was a huge emotional problems with, the, with all of the other owners of these companies. And I finished up losing our house and all sorts of things went through during the same process or just before this process. And so I had all these different experiences where it eventually reduced me into a, just a pile of rubble, really. Uh, that's where I went to. And then on top of that, um, there was this girl that was interested in me and... And so what happened was that I went through all this guilt and shame about actually feeling like I wanted to love this other woman and, and it was a terrible emotions for me because uh, although you know, we did act upon it at that time, it was like these terrible emotions of feeling guilt and shame that I was married and, and all these things. And so eventually what happened was I decided that I had to separate from my wife and I had to separate from the religion. And I did that in a very emotional time where I went back home and lived with my parents and, uh, and allowed all these different emotions to come up, which over the next year and a half I spent most of my time crying, basically. Um, 
dealing with emotions, not with God, because by this stage I thought God had condemned me as well. So I was alone now, and dealing with emotions, I would still see my boys uh, three days a week or so during this time, and I'd have them for three days, and then the mum would have them. And everyone, because I'd left the congregation, left the organisation of Jehovah's Witnesses, everyone treated me as if I was dead. So I, you imagine I'd been totally immersed in it, and now everyone I knew, every single person that I knew, treated me like I was dead. My own parents treated me like I was dead. So I went through lots of emotions, <laughs> as you can imagine, about all of that, and uh, worked my way through lots of things about those emotions. And as I was working my way through those emotions, a whole group of memories started coming up. Right. Now, I don't have any, at this stage, I don't have any beliefs in reincarnation. I have no beliefs in anything other than what I've been taught from the Bible, nothing else. But I feel totally condemned by God, right? So I don't have a relationship with God that I had all my life up until this point. But up that point, at that point, I felt that God had cut me off too. So I was working my way through these emotions and, and for the first sort of three or four months quite suicidal. And then I decided that what happened was just before I was thinking of suiciding, a friend of my boys, um, uh, they had friends and one of the friends was uh, a, a young, two children, a, man, a, a boy and a girl, and they went to visit their father and the father then brought them home and the next day he burnt himself alive in a caravan. And that sort of just sort of gave me a bit of a wake up because I could start by this time feeling the emotion. I could start feeling the emotions that those children would have about that event. So I stopped considering suicide and instead I went to go and get some help. So I visited all these different psychologists and psychi psychiatrists and everything and eventually settled on one who wanted to deal with my emotions because I knew by this stage that I had to deal with my emotions. And then eventually, three months later, I outgrew him um, because I started identifying his emotions better than he could identify. <laughs> so then I went to another one <laughs> and uh, did the same thing. And then three months later, of course, the same thing occurs and outgrew him. But eventually I met a lovely man who was really focused on emotion and he was so good with it, really, really good with emotions. And one day I hope to, that you'll meet him too. He's not on the Divine Love Path, but he helped me for the next year. I visited him twice a week and every time it was an emotional processing of experience where I went through causal emotion. And by this stage I'm getting used to dealing with emotions. Right? So I'm alone, uh, living at this stage with my parents, dealing with causal emotions. And then the woman that was originally attracted to me that I mentioned earlier uh, came into my life and she decided to leave the witnesses at this stage and, and she came into my life. But it was a very turbulent relationship where I only saw her once a month. So I'd see her once a month and then cry the rest of the month and see her once a month and cry the rest of the month. And I wasn't dealing with any causal emotion and, and as you can see I've obviously dealt with it now because I can think back on it in amusement. But um, um, uh, um, I dealt with, you know, emotion, 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 and it was like, ter it was terrible at the time, I can remember, it was just terrible. I used to write pages and pages and pages and pages just on my computer. And in, in the end I got used to feeling emotions, the first three hours of every day I'd just cry. And then I found if I did that, the rest of the day was pretty good. <laughs> right? And then my boys decided, through a lot of religious pressure, because my wife, my ex-wife and the boys were still in the religion, they decided they couldn't see me anymore. And I went through some really bad emotions then, like um, for, for about three or four months, uh, I cried pretty continuously. Um, and then I went through realising some things about God again, realising that no matter what I'd done, God would love me, because no matter, even though my boys didn't want to see me anymore, I still loved them. Does that make sense? Like, I still love them. So, so what I did was I started to phone them, and sometimes they'd answer the phone, sometimes not, and sometimes I'd get the ex-wife who would tell me off, and, then, and so forth. And I did that for another year or so, until a year and a bit later, I decided I had enough self-worth by this stage, so I'd been doing that a couple of times a week, that I'd go around and see my boys. And when I seen them, it just cut me up, because 
my younger son had grown into a man in that time from being a boy. And, um, and I can remember just sitting down the road crying <laughs> about missing out on that part of his life, which I still feel a bit that I have. Anyway, during this time I'm still dealing with my emotions and I've got sort of a relationship that eventually, seven years later, died uh, because of the same reason why in the beginning and that is that there was never any real love there. It was all based on emotional injuries. But during this time I was doing this cause and effect thing. I wasn't dealing with the cause, I was dealing with the effects a lot, right? But during this time, I also was having huge memories of torture, abuse, uh, some rape memories, um, childhood abuse memories, and I'm like, what's going on? Like, I, I've got no idea what's going on. And um, I just believe that I must have suppressed my childhood so much that all of those things happened in my childhood. And I went through all sorts of emotions uh, through throughout that experience. I remember. One, one time I was sitting down describing to the guy who was helping me these nails being getting hammered into my feet. And I couldn't understand it. I just thought, oh, it's, it's a childhood trauma of some kind, you know. And I'm bawling my, and I cried for nearly six months about that one thing. Like it was just emotion after emotion after emotion. And then I remembered other events too. I remembered um, some, uh, things related to my fears of dogs and all these other different things. So if you can imagine fragments of your life all sort of coming together emotionally. Does that make sense? Like whatever you can cope with, whatever you don't fear is what will come up next. Right? So the more I dealt with another emotion, another emotion will come in and so forth. And that's what it was like for the next uh, seven years. So I spent a lot of the time alone, a lot of the time processing emotion, and a lot of time working my way through all of these traumatic events. And eventually um, I came uh, to get to a point where I thought, where, and by the way, during this time I started three other businesses, <laughs> um, which, uh, which just added to the in turmoil of uh, my life. But, but I was controlling it, it really well because I was dealing with emotions now, which meant that things went, worked pretty well. So I became quite abundant. In fact, at one point I had... Uh, by this stage, I was my ideal was to work towards getting enough money to create a place for children to work through their emotions. So that the way I did that was I started developing, developing property, and so I worked through developing property and got a lot of stuff together there. And eventually, I got to have 13 or 14 properties and started to work my way to, to what I thought would be the goal of eventually selling all of these properties, leveraging them into what I wanted to do. So I'm still dealing with emotions, I'm still dealing with all these memories and uh, really traumatic memories and quite often I'm out of action for a day or two or more at a time as I'm dealing with them. And uh, eventually this relationship, this uh, that on-off, on-off thing was off and uh, I went through a lot of emotions about that because I thought it should be on. And, and then about a year and a half after that I met this lady who challenged me about seeing a medium. I've never seen a medium in my whole life. Right? And I disagreed vehemently with them. The reason why is because in the Bible it says, what? For those who know, it says it's a work of the devil, right? Basically. Anyway. <laughs> so, anyway, after a discussion, and she triggered a lot of my emotions in the discussion, I decided I'd go along to one. And this lady... Uh, and by this stage, I'm feeling pretty good, actually. I've, I've dealt with seven years of memories about sexual abuse, torture, rape, and so forth. And, you know, and so I, I'm in a fairly good state, right? I'm feeling really good. My empire is building, right? that I'm enjoying that, you know, enjoying the process of that. I'm driving around in my sports car and starting to enjoy my life, right? And uh, I thought I was starting to really get things together really get things together. Emotionally together, I felt really present emotionally most of the time now. And I felt really good about my emotions and my emotional presence and so forth. So I go along to this medium and she says, oh, you know how you've been dealing with all this stuff? And I said, yeah, yeah. I thought she was going to say, you've been doing really good. <laughs> well, she said, actually, 
there's a huge castle you've built around your emotions and you haven't begun to release them. And I'm going to like, <laughs> my God, like, I've just come out of like seven years of every day almost crying, right? And I'm going, and so I asked for details. She says, yeah, no, they won't tell me anymore. Just that there's this huge castle and you, and you need to do a few little processes and one of them was the journey process. She, she said, you need to do a few little processes and that will help you open up a little bit more to these other emotions. And I'm going, what other emotions could there be? You know, like, honestly. And by this stage, I had a fairly firm belief that uh, God loved me. I had a fairly firm belief about God and how God interacts with people because I could feel it in my life. And I had a fairly firm belief still about um, emotions and, and processing emotions. And I had a pretty firm belief that I dealt with everything. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Not true, not true. Anyway, I go along and, and, and in this, this woman who was challenging me, we started to have a very short relationship and I upset her. And in the process of upsetting her, I, I realised that I seem to have a lot of trouble with women still, <laughs> for some reason. And so I went home and I just cried and cried and cried about how useless I was with women. Like, and so what I did then was I, I just remembered for some reason, and nothing, I don't know why it was, but that I had a love of truth before and I seemed to have lost it. And I was so focused on relationships and being happy in every aspect of my life that I seemed to have lost this love or desire for truth. And so, anyway, I, I do a pretty weird thing. Um, I get on the internet and go to Amazon <laughs> and write down truth and enter you know, and I get a list of books about truth. And so I start searching, you know, this was at night, I was crying. And it's at night, I was crying because I'd just broken up with this relationship. So I've only had three relationships in my life and, and this third relationship, besides Mary, that is, I'm sorry, I should say, um, besides the pure one, um, the, 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 in this relationship, um, it was just there to trigger these emotions about to cause me to get into truth, you know. So anyway, I write truth, write down truth. There's a long list. I think it's three or four hundred books. And I start paying, scrolling down, crying, you know, crying, 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 scrolling down. The titles, reading the title, reading the title, reading the title. And all of a sudden, I read one title. I burst out crying, and I go and sob, 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 sob. And I go back and have a look, and the title says "Angelic Revelations of Divine Truth." So I decide. Oh, that's a bit weird. So I go down and down and down and down and down. And all of a sudden there's another one. I'd forgotten by this stage because I'm still crying, the first one. And, and I'm still crying, so I go down and down and down and down. List. I see another title. It was Angelic Revelations of Divine Truth, Volume 2. <laughs> but I didn't realise that. So I read that and then I'm burst out and I'm down on the floor sobbing again, right? But then I thought, what was the, what was the one of the other one? So I go back up the list and sure enough it was Angelic Revelations of Divine Truth, Volume 1. So I buy them both, right? And then um, I buy them, yeah? But, but, you know, it's Amazon and it's US and it's going to be three weeks before it comes to me. And I'm like, I can't wait three weeks. So I then think, like, the thing that's been with me all my life is the truth is free, the truth is free, the truth is free. God wants to give us the truth and the truth is free. Okay, so I shouldn't have to buy it on Amazon. So I get on the net now and I type in Evangelic Revelations of Divine Truth. And lo and behold, there's a lot of sites that have it for free. Downloadable. Now I have a little dial-up modem thing going on, right, at my home. None of this fancy internet stuff in nowadays. And anyway, although I'm a computer consultant, it was just that the, the place where I lived, which was on a beach, didn't have ADSL or any of those fancy things. So, so what I did was I had to download them using a dial-up modem. <laughs> now, I'm in, I'm in like major meltdown by this stage because I really badly want it. So what I decided to do is find another site that's got anything to do with those same messages and then I search for soulmates. I've always had this belief in my whole life that I'm missing my soulmate, right? Just missing her. And I still have, you know, I'd spent seven years crying about it in a previous relationship, but still 
I had this same feeling. So anyway, I get down all the messages that are soulmates and I decide to download all them and they only take an hour and a half. So I download all them first, put them all in the document, print them all out. I've got a laser printer so that's woof, 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 and then grab them and I'm reading, this is now midnight, one o'clock in the morning, I'm reading, reading, reading the soulmate messages and crying my eyes out because exactly what they're presenting is exactly what I believe about soulmates. Anyway, I'm so keen now to get the angelic revelations of divine truth. So, so, so I download the rest and by the next morning printed all them out and I start reading. Two weeks of reading, crying my eyes out the entire time, in between eating occasionally. I got really sick, so I had to deal with that as well, vomiting, whatever. All that happened at the same time, start vomiting and all these things, reading these messages, crying. And that's my life for the next two weeks. I stopped all my work and that's all I did. Anyway, I, by the end of the two weeks, because I cried a lot in it between, I didn't read very fast, and normally I'm a very fast reader, but um, <laughs> by the end of two weeks, I get to this point of, of, you know, the second volume. So I've gotten through one of these volumes, lots and lots of crying. The reason why there was lots of crying, because every single thing they presented was exactly what I had now come to believe, not through my Bible teachings or anything like that, but through the feelings that I'd had up until that point. And I couldn't understand how this could be the case. Right? Anyway, I'm so overjoyed with this truth that I'm getting that I can't think of anything else. So, so now I'm just like fixated on this truth. You would have called me obsessed, guaranteed. <laughs> anyway, so I'm obsessed with this truth. And the truth is, uh, and so I start reading the next volume. And then I notice that I hadn't noticed before that had been happening all the way along. And that is, I knew in advance what every message was going to say. And, and I just, like, I could not understand it. I just could not understand it. So, you know, anything you don't understand, you put aside, don't you? In that box. But, but it keeps coming back to me. Like, why is this? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? It's like somebody's prompting me, you know? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? I've got no idea why it's happening. But I'm starting to get quite distressed about it because it, it's eerie, you know? It's now feeling like eerie. You know how you get that thing that you're in something and it's so joyful and everything, you go along with it, go along with it, and now it starts getting eerie, sort of, oh, this is like, anyway, it really bothered me and I couldn't resolve it intellectually. I didn't know why. Anyway, and I start the second volume and sure enough, every time I read a message, I know what it's going to say. It says, oh, the truth about God. I know what the truth is about God. I write it all down. Then sure enough, present exactly what I've written down is what the message was saying. Next subheading, truth about spirit world or whatever, and I read that and same thing goes. I write it all down. These are not the same as my beliefs, by the way. These are not the same beliefs as what I grew up with. They're just totally new concepts and yet I seem to know them in advance of reading them. So I then all of a sudden get this inspiration to start drawing the universe. So I start drawing the universe, you know, the spheres, the spheres, the spheres, the soul, God up top, the soul union state, you know, the progression to the soul, you know, and all that. I'm drawing, drawing, drawing now, like, so I'm drawing. And None of this is coming from outside of me. This is all stuff. There's no spirit involved. Nobody's telling me. Nothing's going on aside from it. It's all just coming from inside of me. It's all stuff I know I know. Do you know what I mean? So I draw all of this stuff, all of these universal things. And I'm just wrapped. Like, I'm so happy. I'm overjoyed. Like, all of this stuff that just flowing, flowing, flowing. And I'm emotional the whole time, of course. So it's all flowing all the time. <coughs> And then wham, one in the middle of all of this, I remember who I was. Just, I, I can't explain it other than that. Just remembered. And then all of this crap came afterwards. Like, so I remembered I was Jesus. And I cried and cried, like sobbed my heart out for days on end about it. Because I don't want to be Jesus. I didn't want to be Jesus. I didn't want to be any... By this stage before then, I was feeling like I was going to teach this. I knew I was going to teach this stuff. 
but I didn't want to be Jesus and, and, and I, you know, you know, no one's going to believe me anyway. Like, would you? No, of course you wouldn't. After hearing that story, you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't believe I'm Jesus after hearing that story, that's for sure. So, so, so like, like, I'm in terrible emotional turmoil by this stage. I know who I am now, which is a beautiful thing to know who you are. I know what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. That's a beautiful thing too. But it just is like there's so much fear now because not only was I now having these desires built in me about all these things, but I was now having memories of my life in the first century. So I started having memories of why I went through all of this, what I thought previously was childhood trauma. And I started reconnecting with all the events. You see, in the first century, when I was 21, I was tortured almost to death in the first century. And I reconnected with that memory of all of the different things that happened. And when I was 15, I was, uh, I was um, abused by some, some men. And then I had started having all of these realizations that actually all of these childhood abuse memories that I'd processed were related to my soulmate's life. And I couldn't understand how that happened, but it happened. And later on I understood once I processed some more of the emotions. And then I actually finished up processing the emotions of my crucifixion, along with lots of other emotions. Now, by this stage, like, I'm used to emotional processing. But when you say used to emotional processing, this is emotional processing on a whole different level than what I did before then. And this, I then understood what that lady meant when I visited her, the medium, that I had a whole castle to dismantle. And so my whole life's focus from that moment on became just dismantling the castle. So I sold all of my properties and I spent those money on teaching people these things and I allowed all of these things to come up. I never told them generally I was Jesus, so... You know, I allowed all the things to come up. I gave away CDs and DVDs and whatever else. And I finished up going overseas on a few trips as well and doing the same thing overseas. And all the while dealing with my emotions about identity. And eventually I get to the point where I can feel like I can say to a group of people that who I am. And so I get to that point. And by this stage, I feel quite strongly about the others of the 14. And by this stage, I've actually identified most of them and know who they are and know where they are and so forth. And I knew my soulmate was somewhere up here in Queensland, so I got rid of everything that I had down in South Australia and moved up to Queensland. And in the process of moving up to Queensland, um, I met quite a few people who... And in fact, one of the, pe the groups of people I met was my soulmate's parents. And uh, I didn't know that they were her parents or anything like that. Um, but I just knew I had to be in this location, in the Gympie location, you know, it was around that area. Anyway, I still do presentations, still doing presentations, still working through my emotions. By this stage, I've resolved inside of myself all the issues of identity, which, by the way, is a very, very, it was a very traumatic psychological process. And it certainly wasn't something I enjoyed. And it certainly wasn't something that, um, you know, that I wanted to be. It was, in fact, quite the opposite. I, I had lots of different times where I just, I just disconnected completely from God and said, I don't want to be the person who, what it feels like I am, and for lots of different reasons, lots of different emotional reasons, and, and I had to work through every one of them. And most of it, I, of course, but I was alone, so I did all of this alone. Thank goodness, probably, because if I hadn't done it with someone around me, they probably would have committed me. And my mother did attempt to do that. Um, um, so once she heard that I was saying that I was Jesus, um, she then went to some psychologists and they reported me and then I had to go to have some assessments and so forth with doctors and whatever else. And they then determined very quickly, that uh, I wasn't a danger to myself or to others, and so they allowed me to live by myself instead of being committed. But I had to work through all the emotions of that as well, uh, which uh, brought up quite a few emotions about, you know, my family hadn't been speaking to me for a long time, and then the first time they speak to me, they want to commit me. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of emotions in that. 
And, uh, and my father didn't speak to me for seven years, and my mother about three or four years, and my boys for a year and a half, and so forth. So I've had, I was, I was totally alone at a lot of places in my life. Anyway, so I worked through all of those things, and, and then there's this, this burning desire to teach the truth, so I just focused on my passion. And I thought, well, no one's going to believe me anyway who I am, so maybe the best thing to do is just not tell them. And then, of course, I went through that with God and realised that that disconnected me straight away from God, so I couldn't do that. Then I thought, well, no one's going to believe who I am. <laughs> um, and if I've got to say who I am, then it's going to be a pretty, like, this isn't going to work very well at all, uh, was my feelings. And in fact, everyone around me who heard what I, who I was saying I was, uh, I, I was felt the same way, of course, because that's my law of attraction. So they're all telling me, don't you say that, don't you say that, you know, and, and so forth. So I go through a lot of emotions of condescension from others, ridicule and all those kind of emotions, and eventually I get through all of them and I know what I have to do. So, so I just go ahead and do that, and which is just tell the truth all the time. Just tell the truth all the time. No matter what the results are, tell the truth. And so I just start telling the truth. And ironically, for the first time, uh, after that point, people started to listen. But before that point, before I didn't say the truth, I would have whole groups of the audience angry, rageful with me. I would come out of every audience and go and cry for many times for days on end. And then I would get myself all together again, work my way through a group of emotions, feel really good, go off, do another group. <laughs> And then that would be triggered again and we'd go through the same cycle. To the point where now I don't hardly have any emotions to work my way through anymore. And I feel things quite strongly. And obviously during this change I've made lots of changes and transitions, which are transitions you will find yourself making as well. And a full memory, almost a full memory of my life. So what happened was my first century life, I had lots of memories, and then my memories of the spirit life started coming to me. So I went through the different experiences that I've been in the spirit life. And then I started teaching spirits and talking to spirits and all those kind of things and working my way through issues there as well. And eventually come through all of that to this point where now I know who I am. It doesn't matter to me whether you believe me or not. What matters to me though is that I just want to follow my passion. And my passion is helping people get through all of their stuff so they can connect with God. That's my passion. And that's been always my passion. <laughs> Ever since I can remember in the first century, that's always been my passion. And so I've just processed my emotions all the way through that. Now, there's still memories coming to me, um, and there's still memories... Um, during this time, by the way, memories of our plans that we made in the spirit world came to me. And so I started remembering all of these plans that we'd made, the plans of what we would do in the future, what we would be doing on Earth, why it's all happening now, why is it around 2012 that all of these events are occurring, what was going on in the Earth, what would happen in the Earth in the future, what kind of people would need to make what kind of changes in order for the change of the world to occur. And all of those things, the big, what I call the big picture things, are the big picture things that I haven't talked to any of you about uh, yet. So one day in the future I'll talk to you about them. Um, but um, all those big picture plans came and, and by this stage I'd attracted my soulmate into my life and that's a whole other story <laughs> which Mary can talk to you about at some point. Um, so by this stage we're starting to work through our emotions together, you know, working through and Mary's, Mary having memories of her life in the first century, her life in the spirit world. Exactly the same process I've been through, Mary's going through and started going through that two years ago. So now she's going through this process of remembering these traumatic events from our first century life, her life after I passed, my crucifixion, and then other ones of the 14 started doing it. Some of you have met Cornelius, right? The man who nailed me to the stake. Um, he started going through the same experiences. All of these things are happening independently of each other. So we eventually meet up and then eventually... So Mary was just blown away, went to Darwin, with the first set of memories that you had, which you didn't expect to have at all. 
and it was just meeting a few days after meeting with me, reading with me straight into some memories. And so every one of the 14 is, has had to start going through these processes. Some of the 14 who have returned are in a different state where they're just total denial of any of these processes yet. And there's five or six of the 14 who have not denied all their emotions but are denying some. And then there's myself, Mary and Cornelius who are sort of working through our emotions in a more conscious way. And the others will come on board, I feel, the more, um, I know, the more we deal with our stuff, they'll, uh, they'll start feeling that attraction. Um, but in terms of who they are, there, there's six here in Australia, or five now here in Australia. There's two in Canada, there's two in South America, and there's two in South Africa. Um, and there's uh, two in the US of A who, came, who come from the Vietnamese culture, who are Vietnamese. Um, so altogether, the 14, there's 14. Um, and one of us passed, John, the Apostle John, passed during this five-year period that I was dealing with my emotions, and he was too. But he went into a shutdown place, and when one of the 14 go into a shutdown place, there's a pretty severe law of attraction, and he was murdered um, a month after he shut his emotions down. So, and he's with me now. Um, it was a plan that we'd made that he'd go through these experiences, but at the time I didn't feel it was. And so it was, uh, it was difficult in one way losing his company because he was one of the few of the 14 at the time that were dealing with some of their emotions. Um, so what we end up with is this, this uh, half of the man that's in front of you, um, still working way his, through his stuff, trying to demonstrate to you how to become yourself just by this process that I'm going through becoming myself again. And, and I understand completely why I've chosen to do all of these things. I remember the choices that I made. Um, and while it may be difficult for you to actually connect to emotionally and understand what's going on, I know that in time, if you follow the same path, uh, this divine path that's being presented to you, that you will actually not only come to understand yourself, but also come to understand the truths that I'm presenting to you. Now, John, John Dole, who's um, organized this venue for us today, has done a lot of emotional, like, kinesiology type testing on these truths that I'm presenting. But my feelings are that you don't need to do that. What you need to do is allow yourself to connect to the emotions of it and to see whether there's a ring of truth inside of you about it all and allow yourself to then act upon that emotions inside of yourself. If you do that, you will come to connect with God, and if you connect with God, you will know the truth, because God tells you the truth through that connection. So you won't need me. All I'm here to do is just to be the, an example that you can choose to follow, and it's not that you follow me, but just the example of how to work through all of your emotions and how to work through all of the issues and all the different... Remember I started this discussion off with all the different boxes that, of different areas of things in our life that we'd have to work through in order to get to God. And my suggestion is, um, and maybe I just need to rephrase that, I wouldn't say to get to God. We probably should say in order to allow God to come to us because God is just there waiting for you to make these changes. So, so if you follow all of those things, you'll find that you'll progress. Now, now, some of you believe in reincarnation still. That's okay. You can believe in reincarnation still. Trust me, if you deal with all of your emotions, you will end up with the truth. And the truth will be known by you, whether you're reincarnated or not, by the fact that you'll remember your first incarnation. And if you, if you had a life in the spirit world, like I have, you'll remember that life in the spirit world, and you'll remember your second incarnation. And every one of the 700 incarnations you feel you might have had, you will remember the entire life of that if you do with your emotions. Now, my, I put forward to you that that won't happen to you because the truth is that there's very few people who have ever reincarnated onto this planet. But you can go down that track and as long as you deal with your emotions, you will come to resolution about that particular thing inside of yourself. And you'll remember everything about your entire life. And so what's happening for me 
And what's this pre gradual process going on for Mary too now and Cornelius and others is this process of remembering our entire life. So, of course, I don't remember when I was born because when you're in your first incarnation, you don't remember that. But I do remember when I was born in my second incarnation because you can remember that when you reincarnate. I don't remember in the first incarnation the process of the soulmate separation. But in my second incarnation, because it's a reincarnation in a full, fully conscious zone, I remember everything about it. And it's the most terrible, terrible experience that I've ever had to remember that. And I still am going through lots of grief about that, about the separation from my girl and all of the different traumatic emotions that I've had through my life now dealing with that emotion. And in the second incarnation, you remember your disconnection from God. In the first incarnation, I didn't remember that. But in the second incarnation, this is terrible trauma that I'm still working my way through and still having a struggle dealing with my fears about getting back that relationship that I once had. And so I'm working my way through that emotion as well. And there's this memories of all the different things that I've done and I'm so afraid of them um, because I just... I just find it so hard to allow myself to remember them because to remember them and then present them to you, it will just seem so strange and, and, and like it's just so difficult to remember a, a lot of them because I have so much fear attached with them. So the, the group of emotions I'm working through now is this terrible fear I have about presenting to you the truth about all these different things in the spirit world that you can experience. When I first experienced them, they were beautiful. You know, they were beautiful experiences. But what happened was that through the emotional filters of these terrible two memories, the memory of losing God and the memory of losing my soulmate, and all of these other experiences became traumatic and difficult and to remember. So I'm working my way through all of those different memories. So I've literally got thousands and thousands of subjects that I could talk to you about. Um, but, but I'm... You know, obviously, it will depend on your readiness to receive them as to when we discuss them. But at the moment, I'm still working through groups of difficult emotions about about and difficult fears that I have to work through. And Mary's going through exactly the same process. So we go through these cycles of feeling lots and lots of joy and happiness and peace and calm and so forth, and then whammo into another memory where we remember, we're transported back to our life in the first century where, you know, where I was maybe, you know, tortured and abused and so forth, which happened quite a number of times in my life, unfortunately, and, and even more for Mary in the first century life. And, and then we work through that emotion and release that and we feel the same relief and the same peace and the same happiness that you feel when you release a causal emotion, the same lovely, peaceful, blissful feelings that come from God. And then, and then we go into another emotion and experience a lot of those things too. And so my suggestion is to allow yourself to experience all of your emotions about those things. You will not have as many emotions as what I've had to work your way through. So don't think that my, what I've done is something that you're going to have to do for the next 13 years, right? because it's not. Many of you have already begun emotional work, but... Causal stuff, obviously, is difficult to access, but my feelings are many of you will only have a few years of this process to deal with, just by working your way through different emotions. My experience and the experience of every one of the 14 is going to be very different to your experience. You won't have identity issues to sort your way through unless you believe you're other people from the first century or other centuries of your life and you start working through and you may find in the end that, oh, that was a spirit connected to me. So I've had to work my way through all of those emotions too. Maybe this is a spirit connected to me, a spirit who believes he's Jesus and all that kind of stuff. And I've worked my way through all groups of emotions about that. Of course, I don't have any connections with spirits in the, fact, in the sense that I don't hear them at all. And I can't see them. And, uh, and that won't occur until I'm at one with God. And I know why, but you don't have to trust the answer as to why. Um, but what I'm doing is, I want, what I came here to do is I came here to demonstrate to you how to get to be at one with God without having any gifts inside of yourself. No gift of mediumship, no gift of spirit communication, no special 
special abilities or anything like that. And that's why I came here, to, do, to show you how to become at one with God from that condition, without any help from any single person other than God. Not a single person has helped me through the last five years of experience. Most people have been derogatory and negative and like condescending and <laughs> all of those different things to me during that time. And, and many of you in the past have felt those same emotions. Yes, those of you who know me much better now have felt those same emotions at different times towards me, angry or upset or whatever. And I feel all of those emotions and I've had to work through the emotion, my emotional response to all of those things. And that's why I can stand here in front of you calmly and say who I am and not maybe not that calmly a few minutes ago, but say who I am uh, without worrying about your judgment and your criticism and worrying about what ha will happen with my law of attraction and so forth. And my suggestion to you is when you do the same as that, you will have your connection with God, you'll have your connection with the divine truth, you don't need me, you don't need anyone else in that connection, and you will draw your soulmate into your life and you will start having the same blissful life that I've experienced for a period of my life, the 2,000 year period in between my first century life and here, and I've experienced that most times of bliss and what I'm suggesting is that is open to you as well, just by having a look at those teachings. And you'll find in the end, if you're a man who's a logical man, you'll find there's so much logic in it all, right? and you'll see it all fit together. And if you're a woman who's an emotional woman, you'll find there's so much emotion in it all that all seems to fit together. And if you're either or gender who can merge those two things together, you'll find there's so much truth in what you receive. And you'll start feeling it as God's truth, not as mine. You won't feel it as mine, because I don't feel it as mine. I'm just so grateful that God has taught me this truth right from the time I can remember being alive on the planet. And it's so wonderful to learn it. And there's nothing in comparison to it. And so that's why I want to talk to you about it. Anyway, that was a long-winded answer <laughs> in my normal... Now, of course, there's a lot more I could say because it, <laughs> condensing, condensing 46 years into uh, a few moments is often very difficult. And, um, and sometimes there's a habit of getting things out of sequence as well. But uh, it must be getting pretty late by now. So many of you will probably want to be leaving. So that's fine. If you want to leave now, that's fine. Um, I, would, I would like to thank you so much for your attention over the last two days. And um, I'm sure if you'd like to, we can construct some more events down on this, on this coast. <laughs> um, just recently, we've been offered um, a venue up in the Sunshine Coast that is absolutely stunningly beautiful. And uh, from, from, from about a month's time, we'll, we'll have the opportunity, and it might only be for a short period of time because the venue might be sold or it might not, it just depends on how the desires go of the persons owning the venue. But what will happen is that for at least a short period of time this venue has been offered to us free of charge to present these truths. It's a 400, pretty close to a 400 seat auditorium, as probably as large as this, um, maybe even a touch larger, um, in, in some of the most beautiful pristine surroundings you can imagine, in Butterham, in, uh, in the Sunshine Coast. And so our next venues, we'll be probably having one more meeting at the Udlo address just for the people who want to help us with cleaning up the, the new venue and making sure everything runs smoothly at the new venue because the venue will allow for more people to be present. It has uh, enough room to, to park around 100 cars and it's in this beautiful paradisaic environment. And, uh, and we'll have the opportunity to use that at least for a little while. So that'll be our next, our next venue up in the coast the next time we're up there. Before then, we'll have a, we've got the Brisbane venue coming up in a month's time. And I forget exact 
the dates. Um, 18th and 19th. Yeah, it's the weekend of that uh, that week or something. 18th. Anyway, I've got it on the net and it's there available for you. And in that time, I would like to ask those of you who are regularly attending, there are basically three or four departments that we're going to have to set up for this new venue. One is a cleaning department because we want to make sure, because it's been provided to us for free, we would like to, it's a, and it's an absolutely beautiful venue, we want to make sure it stays in the exact same pristine condition as what we've uh, received it in. And so we want to have a little team of people who can make sure that it's always left in the same pristine condition that, that we, uh, we have found it in. So we need a little cleaning team. We'll need a team of people who can um, maybe handle some of the um, laying out of the chairs and, uh, and also some of the arrangements of the car parking. And that, let's call that the attendant team, shall we? Or the service team. Who, and uh, so we need a little team. And what we need is some volunteers, basically, to handle these different teams. Um, Mary, you wanted to say? And so what we want to do in our next Brisbane talk is talk to some of those teams about what we would like to do. So that will shape some of the talk in Brisbane. And, uh, and then what we would like to do before the event happens is to take you, those people in those teams, to the location of the event and show them the premises and show them what needs to be done. Does that make sense? So, uh, but it will be voluntary. And, and by the way, if you don't want to do any of it, and if none of you do any of it, myself and Mary have decided we're going to do it. So, um, so I'm just inviting you to be a part of that process. So, um, but we're pretty keen. Uh, on the beautiful venue that's been offered to us by the Patellas and, and it's just so lovely that it's really worth... Sorry? No, the, the, the new venue that I'm talking about in the, is in the Sunshine Coast in Butterham. But we'll be doing a presentation in Brisbane just to for those people who want to be a part of actually cleaning up the hall and doing the attendant type stuff as well. <coughs> yeah. You wanted to say, babe? No, we can just inform people by email. Perhaps we can just inform people by email. Yes. We, we won't need to. It won't need to form a part of the general presentation. Yeah. We what we'll do is inform you by email what's going on. However, I'm having a lot of trouble with email at the moment because my particular provider has a has got a block on spam and a lot because now we've got seven or eight hundred people on the email list. It's now starting to treat some of our emails as spam. And so what's happening is some of your, some of your stuff is not being received on the email list because particularly if you're a Hotmail account provide, um, Hotmail has blocked my provider. So um, what I'm going to suggest to you is that from now on what we're going to try to do is put all of the details about coming events and everything as soon as we know about them on the website, all right? So you will have to actually physically go to the website if you want to know what the arrangements are going to be. The website address, as a reminder, is just www.divinetruth.com and if you want to be on an email list that isn't working, office <laughs> at divinetruth.com. Um, and I'm going to try to work through why... <laughs> At the moment, I'm having to break down the email list into hundreds at a time and then send it over a few days before the messages can get sent, which is a bit of a long-winded process. Um, but what we'll do is we'll let you know the details about coming events and we'll also let you know the details about coming events here. We're also going to be having some coming events shortly in Mackay and in New Zealand, which uh, we'll inform you about as well. So um, we'll just keep in contact with you if you've left us with contact details. But thank you so much for your attendance today and thank you so much too for your donations that you've given us.